Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Beyond the Yellow Tape. I'm Julian, this is Nitty, and today we have a great episode. We have a great episode about forensic entomologies, creepy crawlies, bugs, insects, but I'll let Nitty introduce our guest. Thank you, Julian. Hello, everyone. Uh, this episode is actually very, very interesting. We loved it. We could not stop asking questions. So I'm sure you're going to learn a lot of terms on board forensic entomology. Um, and the guest we have for today's show is Dr. Crystal Hans. Um, she is the assistant professor of forensic entomology department at Uni Purdue University. And trust me, you do not want to miss this one out. But before we get into the episode, you know the drill, guys. Please do not forget to like, share, and subscribe to our channel, Beyond the Yellow Tape, and let's get into it. <laughs> All right. So uh, here we are with Dr. Crystal Hans, and uh, so we'll, I'll just jump right into it. So can you please tell us what is forensic entomology? So forensic entomology is just the application of information about insects to legal investigations. And so insects can be used in different ways. And depending on when the insect arrives and what kind of activity uh, they're responsible for, we can use that information about insects primarily for death investigations. Okay, okay. That makes a lot of sense. So um, what are the main insects that are covered in entomology, like uh, what are the main insects that you guys come across in the field? So in in entomology, there's tons and tons of diversity of insects, but within the specialty of forensic entomology, there's some insects that are attracted to the smell of decomposing remains. And so the two main groups of insects that we interact with are flies and beetles. And so within our flies, it's primarily the blowflies, they're the shiny metallic, the real, I think they're beautiful uh, flies that show up to the decomposing remains. They're the same flies that you might find hovering over your trash can. So they're really common and they have a really strong sense of smell for the odors associated with decomposition. So they arrive pretty quickly and start to lay their eggs on the remains. So the flies are what we call the, the first arrivers to the remains so they can get there pretty quickly. But throughout the process of decomposition, there's other insects that show up for different purposes. So that's where we see a lot of our other beetles that will arrive at different stages of decomposition. Okay, okay, that, that makes perfect sense. So um, I guess, so for like, I guess the blowfly example, can you explain, well, I don't know, but actually I'll drop back. So how can these various insects that you guys cover help in determining something like time of death? Yeah, so the insects that I work with, so we'll we'll start with the blowflies. So as I mentioned, they have a really strong sense of smell for the odors that are associated with decomposition, whether that's decomposition of an animal carcass or of human remains. And so those flies, because of that sense of smell, the females are looking for a resource to deposit their eggs. So that resource is the decomposing remains. So the female flies are on the lookout for a useful resource for their offspring. So once they smell those odors of decomposition, they arrive relatively quickly and the females will start to deposit their eggs. And typically the females go for the natural openings. So especially areas of the face. So the eyes, ears, nose, mouth, those are some of the primary areas that the female flies will lay their eggs. So those eggs will hatch into our smallest maggot. So a first instar and maggots, all they're going to do is eat. So they don't need to rest. They don't need to sleep. They're just going to keep feeding. So as they feed and they grow, they mature into the next stage of maggot. So that's the second instar. And then they keep eating and growing and they become the third instar. That's our largest maggot stage. And then once they finish feeding, they'll move off of the remains or under the remains, or if it's outside into the soil, if it's dry around the body. And there they're going to form a, a case. It's almost like a cocoon and that's called a, a pupa. And so while they're in that protective case, they'll be transforming into an adult fly and they'll emerge and now they can disperse and locate food and continue that life cycle. 
So we can use this information about these insects. So as a forensic entomologist, I know what all of these different life stages look like. And when I arrive to a scene, I can observe the oldest insects that have been developing on the body. So say we show up and I notice that there's those large third instar maggots. I can collect those maggots. I can determine what type of fly is it. And different species of fly require different amounts of time to develop to their different life stages. And that's dependent on the temperature that they experience. So I can use this information about the temperature that they developed at and the type of fly. And I can work backwards in time to figure out when were those maggots first deposited on the body as eggs. And what that does is that provides a timeline for the minimum amount of time that the insects have been active and the minimum amount of time that someone has been deceased. Mm, so every stage has a uh, set number of days, hours that it's going to be like first, second, or third uh, instar, you called it? Yeah, so there's there's some uh, ranges for how long it will take different species to develop all the way through that life cycle. But insects, mm -hmm. they can't generate heat like we can. So they're reliant on the ambient temperature. And so the okay. hotter it is, the faster they develop. And the cooler it is, the slower they develop. And so we have to have information about the weather and about the temperatures right, okay. that they experience to, to actually do those calculations. Okay, that makes that makes perfect sense. So um, what does the packaging and transportation of some of these in insects like the blowflies and the beetles, how, do, how does that work? So when I am at a scene collecting, so there's different types of containers that I have to put different insects into. And when a forensic entomologist is doing a collection, so we're, we're not just looking for one type of insect. Uh, as I mentioned, we're looking for the oldest insects that have been developing on the remains. So those are the insects that have been there, they're associated with the body, but we're going to collect uh, a variety of different types of insects that we find as well. So there's a few different techniques that we use to collect our insects. So if there are uh, adult flies or beetles that are flying around the body, and once you walk up to it, they kind of get disturbed. And so they'll kind of fly over it. And sure. so there's a, a net that we can use to sweep those up and put them into a container. And so those, those insects are important just to tell us what species are there when we were at the scene. We don't know necessarily if those insects had developed with the body, but it's important to document them as well. And so okay. we'll put those into containers either with alcohol or we'll bring them back to the lab and we'll put them in the freezer. And mm -hmm. then in terms of the, the eggs, so the fly eggs are really delicate when you collect them. So uh, I generally use a paintbrush, like a fine tip paintbrush that I can use to pick up the eggs so that I don't crush them when I'm trying to collect them. Okay. And when we're making our collections for our insects, especially our eggs, our maggots, we're going to take one collection that we're going to keep alive because we want to raise them up to adults. If you've ever looked at a maggot before, um, they can all look very similar. And so it's a lot easier to identify the flies than it is the maggots. And so we'll right. make one collection of the insects at all the different sites on the body. So if we have uh, a maggot mass that's near the eye, I'll make a collection there. If I have one in the mouth, I'll make a collection there and I'll keep those separate. And in order to keep those insects alive, I have to give them food. So when I go to a scene, I usually bring a can of wet dog food. That works really well. The maggots uh, seem to enjoy it. And I'll uh, put the eggs of the maggots onto that food in a secure container that's breathable so that I can keep them alive. Not not to cut you off, but I got to ask, why do you want to grow them until they're adults? Like, what is that? Uh, How is that helping? Yeah. So growing them until they're adult flies uh, is because it's easier to identify the adult flies. So sometimes with maggots, gotcha. especially the early maggots, they're mm -hmm. really difficult to identify, especially if you're looking at them through a microscope. Whereas right. the adult flies, they have a lot more distinguishing characteristics, which is easier to identify. Gotcha, yeah. gotcha. So that's why we have one collection that we keep alive and try to, we call it rearing them to adult flies. Mm -hmm. And then another collection that we preserve. So uh, 
the other collection that I'll make, so the same spots, so say we have insects that are in the eye and in the mouth, I'll do a collection there as well. And for something like maggots, uh, I boil them briefly. So I'll bring some hot water with me and I'll boil them briefly so that they, I know I call it making maggot tea, which is probably really <laughs> off-putting for tea drinkers, but, <laughs> but, <Love> tea. But, <laughs> but by boiling them, what it does is it makes the maggot body kind of puff up a little bit sure. because if I just drop them directly into alcohol, they can shrivel and it makes it more difficult. It makes my job more difficult back in the lab when I have to look at them to identify them. So whenever possible, I boil them first and then put them <clears throat> into alcohol. And then after the alcohol, you put them, you look at them under the microscope? Yeah. So once we have all of our collections, all of our containers, I'll bring that back to the lab the flies that I'm going to keep alive and raise to adults. Uh, we feed them beef liver in the lab. So liver is a really nutritious food source for them. So the dog food is just for ease of transport. It's sure. easier for me to have a can of dog food than it is to have a container of liver when I go out. So, so I'll usually do that. But um, for the preserved specimens, when we get them back to the lab, that's when we have to identify them under the microscope. So all of those collections that I've made, I'll pull them out of their vials with the alcohol and I'll have to go through each of those maggots separately to identify them. Um, you To drop back a little bit, you said that you go, you when you get to the lab, you put them in a the freezer. And I know working on this job that um, I guess like they say the humane way of like kind of, if you find insects or anything on like evidence we might receive, they will say the humane way is put them in a the freezer because then they kind of go into a sleep coma and then they just they kind of just never wake up again. Yeah. So, so there's a, a few techniques that entomologists use. And the, the other way that you can do it is there's a chemical that you can suffocate them with, yeah. but that can be a, that can be a problem introducing another chemical when you're at the scene and sure. it, it smells very similar to nail polish remover. It's kind of a, a derivative mm. of that. Um, but it can be a little bit uh, tedious to have to do that, to, to oh. put a container with that chemical and add the insects and then hope that it's enough to suffocate them. So I, it's just easier for us to put them in the freezer, especially if it's a short amount of time between when we collected them to when we get them back into the lab. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. And um, you also said that you collect them from like different places, like different uh, orifices, the mouth and the eyes and all the mm -hmm. I guess, openings. Um, do Are there like does, could that like affect um, like time in tech? Cause you, you have to kind of work backwards to find like time of death. Does that affect it anything? And are they like one type of like maybe insects that are kind of, what's the word I'm trying to find? Or more uh, enticed to the eye as opposed to the mouth, as opposed to the ears? So, so there, the reason why we do those collections in different areas is because there could be different species that are present in different locations. Mm. And so, not necessarily one is going to be more attracted to the eyes compared to the mouth. So the reason why the flies are attracted to those locations in the first place is because of the mucous membranes. So those moist areas, and they're also kind of protected, like the eyes, the, the nostrils, the mouth, the ears. These are areas that have enough moisture so that their eggs don't dry out, which is one mm. of the challenges that the insects face. And it's also protective because... Once the female lays her eggs, she's not going to stay there. She's not waiting for those, those eggs to hatch. She's not going to take care of her offspring in any way. So she just leaves them in the best possible place and hopes for the best. And there's a lot of predators and parasites and, and all sorts of things that can attack those eggs. So by right. placing it in a location that's a little bit more secluded, she's trying to do the best that she can for her offspring. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, that makes a lot of sense though. All right, fair enough. Um, and I guess another question, just to, you don't have to go super deep into this one, but um, you said like the um, the blow, fi blow flies were like the first encounters of the bodies. So, and then you said you mainly do like blow flies and beetles, like about how long until like, I guess the beetles would show up to a body as compared to the um, blow flies? Yeah, so that really depends on the area and the environment. So mm -hmm. right now I'm in Indiana. And so on a, a hot summer day, we can have flies that show up 
almost immediately. So when we go to do research and we use pig carcasses as a model of human decomposition, we'll put our pigs out and it's almost like the flies have been following us, waiting for us to set the carcass down because they're just waiting right. to get onto it. So that can happen really quickly. And then once you have some of those eggs that have hatched into maggots, some of the beetles that are predators, they show up to the remains because they want to eat the maggots. They're hunting the maggots. And so once you have some maggots, then some of those beetles show up. But I have colleagues that live in other areas of the country where there's really low humidity and high temperatures, like in a desert, and sure. they get beetles on the first day because they're mm. not getting a lot of those flies because the temperatures are too extreme for some of those wow. flies. So it really depends on the environment that you're in. But but typically in the Midwest, in my experience, it's been flies show up first and then the beetles will start to follow within the next couple of days. Gotcha. Okay, okay. Makes sense. Um, so again, I guess we're talking about like a, a body, a decomposing body. So what are the stages of a decomposing body? Yeah, so, um, and there's some... There's definitely some debate about how the stages are classified uh, in different areas of forensic science, but uh, most of us in the forensic entomology community, uh, we have settled on five stages of decomposition. Okay. And so the first stage is considered fresh. And so this is immediately after death. And at this point, um, humans can't necessarily detect the volatiles that are given off during decomposition, but the insects certainly can. So if we arrived, we might not smell anything that we would associate with death and decomposition, but as soon as you die, your muscles start to give off those volatiles and that's what the insects can pick up on. Yeah. And so the fresh stage, it really depends on the environment. It depends on the temperature and the humidity that the body is in as to how long that will last. But during that time, your body is cooling, your blood is settling, your muscles are starting to stiffen. So all of the, the typical things that you think about soon after death. Right. And so that stage will end when the body starts to bloat. And so bloating is the next stage. And that's because we're covered in microbes inside and out. And mm -hmm. after death, those microbes don't necessarily stop working. So one of the byproducts of those microbes is gas. And so a lot of the smells that we associate with, with decomposition are because of those microbes and what they're producing. And so as that gas starts to build up, especially in the abdomen, we have a lot of bacteria in our digestive tract. As the gases start to accumulate, that causes the body to start to inflate. And so during that bloated stage is when we have distension of the remains uh, we have a lot more insect activity. So the flies will start to arrive during the fresh stage. They're laying their eggs and then their eggs will hatch into maggots. The bloated stage, they're still arriving, but now we have maggots that are also feeding at those areas. And then um, as those gases accumulate and as you have maggots that are starting to penetrate the tissue, the gases will start to be released. And when that happens, we move into the next stage. So that's active decomposition. And so during this stage, uh, it's considered active because this is primarily when we have a lot of insect activity. So we mm -hmm. have masses of maggots or in some instances, just tens of thousands of maggots that are completely covering the remains. So right. that's considered active. And that's when they're really consuming a lot of that tissue. And so once the maggots have finished feeding and they've consumed most of the soft tissue, now they move away from the remains. They're trying to find a dry location to move into their next life stage so they can pupate. And when they move off, what's left behind is really some of the cartilage or tendons or some of the other bits that haven't been consumed. And so we consider this the advanced decomposition stage. Now it's- Are they, still, sorry, yeah, are, they, are, are they not consuming some of these tendons or cartilage because it's like too hard to get into or are they like just all full or something like that? I think it's probably a combination. I think they probably could, but the maggots, um, my guess is that the way that they're, I do this, like they have mouth parts, like they have two little hooks as their mouth. It, it's actually okay. kind of cute if you look at it under a microscope. I guess for people that like maggots, it's cute. Fair enough. And so, <laughs> and so 
and they'll consume the soft tissues. And so in, in terms of nutrient richness, the organs and the muscles are going to be more beneficial for them rather than something like cartilage or tendons, which could also be tough. And as the that soft tissue is removed and all you have are some of those harder parts, it's easier for some of our other beetles to consume that. They can scrape some of that away from the bone. So it's easier for them to consume. So I think the maggots are more interested in what's the easiest, not that they're mindful of this necessarily, but what is the easiest food that they can consume and how quickly can they develop? Because every minute that they're there is a dangerous time for them because of all right. of the potential predators and, and other issues. So, gotcha. so from that advanced stage, um, and that again, will depend on the environment and how many insects are there. But from that stage, we move into the last stage of decomposition, which is just the skeletal, uh, or some people just refer to it as the remain stage. And that's where there's very little insect activity, uh, very little resource, if any, and that can go on for an extensive period of time um, if the remains aren't discovered. Okay, okay. So you said fresh, bloating, active decomposition. I think I missed one. And advanced. then advanced, advanced decomposition. decomposition. And yeah. then the last one you said not skeletal, skeletal but skeletal oh, or remains it's it goes okay, by skeletal. Yeah. gotcha okay mm -hmm. okay and i guess it'll be different de depending on humidity and where the body is but like where you are on an average day how long would each stage last you think so um based on i think i think it's easier for me to tell you from a research perspective because at that point i put the the resource out and i know exactly how long right. it is, whereas the cases I work, I get called at all different stages. So um, average summer day with our temperature and humidity, uh, we see that it takes uh, a pig that's approximately 150 pounds, nine days to be fully skeletonized. So it can happen pretty quickly. The fresh stage is usually the first 24 hours. The bloat stage is the next 24-ish hours. And then the active stage really kicks in and we have all of that insect feeding and then the last couple of days kind of advanced and then it's all just skeletal and everything's starting to dry out. Um, I have a question. That, oh, sure. Maybe. Sorry, I haven't gone for a while. <laughs> <laughs> you can't see me. <laughs> so, you know, no, I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, I went through your resume and you have a lot of grants uh, regards to cold case investigations. Yeah. Um, which was very striking and interesting to me because if you, like you just mentioned about the stages and in my head, like a cold case is something that if they have preserved the um, the insects or made, they, may, they might not have preserved the insects. And if you have skeletal remains, how does your expertise board in that um, direction for cold cases? Like what yeah. stages mainly that you work on? Yeah, so I've had requests for all different types of cases and they can be cases that are cold that are within the last five years and nobody's really done anything with them. Or I've had cases that are from the 1990s and um, sometimes insects are preserved, which is always great. Sometimes they're preserved, but they weren't done in a, a great technique, so they didn't hold up as well as I'd like. But sometimes the insect evidence was completely overlooked during that investigation, or there were documents where it's like, oh, there's insects, and this could be useful, but nobody collected them. And then they they burned the clothing, and then they cremated the body, and nobody thought to collect anything. And so in instances like that, where my expertise plays a role is um, in the photos and the documents. And so understanding what, what potential species could have been present, if somebody had taken the time to collect it, here's what information it could have provided, and here's how we could potentially narrow down that time frame. And for cold cases, that's usually one of the primary questions or one of the areas of contention, because you have two different sides saying two different things, and they want they want a solid answer about that timeline. So so that's where the forensic entomology expertise can come in. 
Um, but a lot of the cold case work that I do with nonprofits and with uh, families and survivors is more on the uh, getting my students involved in cold case investigations and teaching them techniques about how to how to advocate, how to support these cases, and how to do research to try to put together some meaningful material to raise awareness about these cases. So I, I kind of work in cold cases in a couple different avenues. So how do you educate the students with, uh, with presentation of evidence in the court, considering uh, with a lot of traction moving towards DNA, and then you have all this fry earrings where it has to be supported by evidence? Like, uh, do you usually get accepted when you present that evidence in court or is there some kind of a backslash considering like if you don't have DNA, that's it. Like, how does it play for you? Yeah. So are you talking about for the entomology yeah. side of things? Yeah. So I've, I've testified in court. Um, a lot of times I'll do all sorts of work and we'll get ready for trial. And then there's a plea deal <laughs> and somebody takes a plea. And then we, you know, a couple of weeks before the trial is set, we kind of find out. Um, but I haven't had any issue. I think forensic entomology as a science, um, even though I know that there's always this expectation that DNA is present in every case and DNA is going to solve everything and the jury wants to see DNA presented because that's what they see on TV and that's the the golden yep. uh, ticket there. Um, I think that as a field, forensic entomology has been able to explain itself and and really be able to explain to the jurors uh, and the attorneys where the insects are interacting and how that can really contribute to that timeline. So the insects might not be the one key piece of evidence, but it's a corroborating piece of evidence that gives credence to that timeline. So, so in terms of acceptance in court, I feel like within forensic entomology, I don't think any of us have really had an issue with that. And usually we're not the only expert that gets called. So there's a, a whole suite of people that are called for different cases. Fair, fair. Makes yeah. sense. Makes sense. <clears throat> I'll let you um, take a question. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I guess the uh we we had a couple of like I guess terms that we never heard of in reference to um entomology. So I wanted to ask, um, can you explain what a necrophage is? Yeah, so necrophage is just uh an organism that feeds on decomposing material. So for our insects, like I mentioned with the blowflies. So the females are, their mouth parts are just little tubes with sponges at the end. So mm -hmm. in terms of feeding from the remains, they're drinking the decomposition fluid or some of the blood, but their offspring, those maggots are the ones that are actually consuming the tissue. And so any of our insects that are actively feeding on the remains, we would consider a, a necrophage. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, let me skip ahead a, a little second. I remember you were talking about earlier, you guys... I guess there was a body out and you, it was in a location and maybe it was, you said it was too humid, I believe, or too dry and the beetles came after a day. Mm -hmm. Is it, is it ever like a circumstance like that specifically, like where the beetles will kind of get there in step with the maggots? So that would kind of mess up trying to determine time of death or like what happened? So it wouldn't necessarily mess up that timeline. So when we're collecting the insects, we're looking for the oldest insects that are active on the body. And so the information that I'm able to provide in an investigation is that timeline. So how long have these insects been active and feeding on the remains? I can't speak to what happened before the insects got there. And there are certainly examples where remains have been concealed, or maybe they were put in a freezer for a couple of years before they were available for insects. So I can provide the information about how long have the insects been active and been feeding on the body? So in that example, some that are in the desert that have that experience where the beetles show up, those beetles are, are showing up and the body's already starting to mummify because it's so hot and the humidity is so low that it's a very different decomposition process compared to what we see here in Indiana. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, do you only look at the life of the insects or also you examine them for anything that they would have eaten or like the insect itself, like internally? Yeah. Yeah. So you can, um, 
you can basically crush up those insects and do toxicological testing on them. It's called entomotoxicology. Yeah. So it's like a drug testing the maggots to see if they've consumed any tissue that had any substances in it. Yeah. And that knowing those chemicals that are present in the tissue, that can be important for a forensic entomologist. Um, and there's certainly autopsies I've been to where I've collected maggots specifically for that purpose to be tested. And so um, having an understanding of those chemicals because certain controlled substances can affect the development rate of our insects. So we have to know what potential substances might be interacting. Does it affect the freezing of the insects in this in the toxicology testing or it has no overlapping? To my knowledge, the freezing doesn't affect it. And normally when I collect the samples, they go into a container and I, I don't think that the freezing will, will interfere with that analysis. Yeah. I just, uh... yeah. <laughs> that's, uh, that's interesting. Um, is it anything that like, this is a side question, I guess, from that answer just now, is it anything like a human could like ingest that a fly might, you know, I guess, try to feed off of this decomposing body that may kill that yeah. um, <laughs> that uh, blowfly before it's ready to hit its, uh, you know, before it matures fully? I, I think that there's probably, there's a lot of room for growth in that research area because I've certainly had cases where not necessarily that the insects are dead, but that there's very suspiciously little insect activity for remains that there should be a lot of insects and I, and it's it's in an area where there's suspected uh, methamphetamine use mm -hmm. that's one area that i think and it, you have to understand trying to get the research um permits to be able to perform that type of testing can be a challenge right. uh, so so there has been work done on uh say for example the effect of cocaine and it the maggots can eat it it speeds up their development and so, and it makes oversized maggots. So when we would normally have a second instar maggot that would be small, you have a really, really big uh, maggot that's that same life stage. So it can affect their development. Um, I know one of my students, my PhD student, she's looking at the influence of different pesticides. So we live in a agriculturally heavy area in Indiana. And so she's looking at what's the effect of these pesticides and how could it have consequences for our insect evidence. And so some of her research with pig carcasses, where she sprayed the carcasses with the recommended dosage of pesticides that a farmer would use. These are not abnormal concentrations. When she sprayed those carcasses, a lot of the flies that showed up to lay their eggs died right on the spot. They weren't even able to lay their eggs because of the pesticide presence. And what that did is it really slowed down the rate of decomposition because you just didn't have that much insect activity. So there's certainly things, whether it's ingested or the environment or something that gets applied after death that can affect the way that our insects interact with those remains. Yeah. Very interesting. Uh, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll let you go ahead and admit it. Oh, uh, you can go. That's fine. Oh, um, so another term that we were trying to get across are uh, what are incidentals? Incidentals, um, and there's a, there's a few different terms that get used for the same those same things. So incidentals, we consider the other uh, organisms, other arthropods that aren't necessarily interested in the decomposing remains, but they might happen to be in the habitat, or they might be using the remains as a habitat. So they're not there because of the decomposition. It's something you know, a spider might show up. Maybe they're hunting a couple of things or they're living underneath the remains or in the clothing of the decedent. Uh, millipedes, uh, isopods, I think they call them roly polies in Indiana. Uh, gotcha. So those are things that just happen to be there. And so a lot of times when investigators will collect insects for me, they'll collect all of these incidentals because they're close to the body or they happen to be on it. And so they'll collect butterflies that just stop there to drink some of the decomposition fluid because it's a good food resource. Now the yeah. incidentals, we can't use them for an investigative timeline because they're not developing on the remains. 
they're just there temporarily or they just happen to be walking over the remains because it's in their habitat. Gotcha. Okay. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So that would mainly be cases where there are more insects around. I... Typically, typically, yeah, like an outdoor, outdoor. Uh, in the soil. So there's lots of insects that are in the soil or maybe they're underneath the remains or in the grass and they just happen to be there and somebody thought, oh, this might be important. So, um, has, uh, I don't know if Julian asked this question, um, does the fly, uh, decom the fly activity depend on the body structure? I mean, like the fat content in the body or, uh, male or female, um, has that shown, I'm sorry, it's a, it's not one of your questions, but no, no, that's no, that's question. okay. yeah. So, uh, so based on what we've seen, there's not really, uh, a certain preference for for those kind of um, characteristics. Now, different uh, body sizes can differentiate the types of insects that arrive. So there are some, especially, so one of our other flies that might show up to the remains is called a flesh fly. And flesh flies are, are interesting compared to our blowflies. So our blowflies, they lay eggs, the eggs hatch into maggots. Flesh flies are very different they show up and they actually wait for the egg to hatch and the female fly gives birth to a live maggot. And so it's a very different process. So because of that, she lays fewer offspring, but they're ready to feed as soon as they get deposited on the remains. And so what we see is that a lot of those flesh flies, because there's fewer offspring being deposited by an individual female, and you have to think about being one maggot competing with all these other maggots, that a lot of those flesh flies tend to go for smaller resources. So they'll go, go for smaller sets of remains, or if we're talking about animal models, they'll go for smaller rodents or you know other smaller carcasses. So we see some difference with the overall size, but to my knowledge, not, not a real preference for uh, any particular sex or any of those other characters. Sorry, just random. Yeah. Um, and Another term that we would like to get some explanation on, uh, something called fly spec, if I say it right. Uh, would you mind sharing a little bit of detail on it? Yeah, so uh, I'm I'm interpreting this as some of the work that my colleague Dave Rivers does, uh, which he's actually in Baltimore. And he's probably like the number one person I think of in terms of this research. So, so he's done a really excellent job at examining the behavior of the flies when they're interacting with different fluids that you see at a scene. So whether it's decomp or blood, those flies with those spongy mouth parts, they're going to take up some of those, some of that liquid, and usually they take up more liquid than what they can actually process. So when a fly lands, you'll see them regurgitate or defecate out some of that excess liquid. And when this happens, if, if you don't know how to interpret it or you've never seen flies do that, it can very easily be uh, misconstrued as blood spatter because of the sheer number of spots that they leave. And it's really confusing for a, an yeah. analyst to look at that and say, I have no idea what happened here. And it's actually just the flies that have been making a mess and uh, making it a lot more difficult. So, so yeah, my colleague has done a lot of research with that, trying to examine what those, what those specs look like and how, how they can easily be confused for blood spatter, but it's a, a really interesting area of research. Wow. Very interesting. Yeah. Um, sorry. Another off question. Sorry, Julia. I joined no, no. I'm going to take <laughs> advantage. <laughs> uh, so have you ever encountered a scene where you have animals in the house? for example, a dog or a cat, and then you see fly activity, has that interrupted their process? Um, and if so, can you determine the stage of decompositions to flies then? So are you talking about pets that are still alive? Or still pets alive, still alive. alive. Yeah, so I personally haven't experienced, and I know one day it's probably gonna happen, I haven't seen any evidence of pet scavenging its owner, which I, I know it does happen, dogs and cats and all sorts of animals. 
Um, not every time I don't, I always tell my students like, this is not a, a guarantee just because you have a pet, like your pet's not going to eat your face. Like, don't, <laughs> <laughs> don't think about it like that. Um, so I haven't, I haven't experienced that. There certainly have been pets in the home, um, but they haven't interfered with any of that investigative process. But I do have a colleague who's had several cases where the decedent wasn't found for a substantial period of time and the pets also died. And so oh. now you have both the human and the animal that's being colonized by the insects. And sometimes there's different species that are colonizing those at different time points. So, so it can certainly complicate things if you have more than one set of remains, especially if it's an animal that has fur. So oh, interesting. Yeah. So you would see two different uh, types of flies on two different human remains or just the stage of? Um, so for, for those examples, so if you have a, a human that dies and then maybe a, a week or two after the pet dies, then you could have potentially different species. But uh, one of my, my former master's students actually looked at decomposition of cat carcasses. So another animal that has a lot of fur. And she noticed some really unusual uh, locations where the females put their eggs. So not the, the typical openings that we expect with humans. And some other complications when you have that tightly packed fur, how difficult it can be to actually detect some of those insects. And some of the female flies would just burrow themselves into the fur. You couldn't even see them until yeah. you move the fur back and they're kind of hidden in there. So there's, I think there's yeah. a lot of, a lot of room for growth in the area of veterinary forensic entomology, just because a lot of the applications that we have for the human decomposition, we can use with animals, but there's definitely some differences there. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. sure. Julian, your turn. Um, oh, um, <laughs> I guess the last term, I suppose, we were trying to understand what PMI stood for. Yeah, so there's, if you read any of the forensic entomology literature, there's a lot of terminology that gets used in different different terms that can, can mean very similar things. And so PMI stands for post-mortem interval. And the easiest definition of that is that's the time between death and discovery of the remains. And so as a forensic entomologist, the term that I, that I tend to use and that I include in my case reports, uh, I'm able to provide the investigators with the time of colonization. So I can tell you, here's when the insects first laid their eggs. Here's when the body was colonized by insects. And that's the time frame that I can provide. So as I mentioned earlier, I can't speak to what happened to the body before the insects got there. And there's lots of different right. factors that could could have you know resulted in variation in that time frame but i can tell you about the insects and how long they have been active and so the pmi is really that full length of time the time of colonization is how long the insects have been active there gotcha gotcha that makes sense okay i'll let liddy uh nitty ask the last two <laughs> would you have any example of a case where entomology was the deciding factor for a positive or a negative ruling in the case? Yeah, so I have a an example where entomology was really useful and it it wasn't anything that went to trial, but it was kind of that crucial piece that really um, helped to, to confirm some of those details. So, so without getting too graphic uh, about this one, because it is a pretty unusual one, um, this is from about a year and a half ago. I got a phone call from one of the coroners that I work with regularly. And he said, oh, we had this real weird, real, real weird call that came in where somebody reported that there was a death and dismemberment uh, at a home. And he said, according to the perpetrator, they went and, and asked him and he fully admitted to it. He said that Two and a half weeks prior, he had killed his his partner and had dismembered her, and he was planning to dispose of the remains. And so um, I get this phone call, and I said, okay, I'll be there as soon as I can. Now, two and a half weeks that have gone by since death and this dismemberment occurred. This is in the middle of the summer. 
you're expecting a lot of insect activity to be present. And uh, after the dismemberment, the remains were placed into garbage bags. And so I've done some research on concealing remains in different types of, of containers, suitcases and carpet mm -hmm. and garbage bags. And what we see in that research is that even if the flies can't access the remains, they can smell them and they'll put the eggs around the knots of the bag and in the folds of the plastic. I think the females are just hopeful that maybe the maggots will figure out a way to get in there, but they can smell it and they know that it's a resource that could be useful. So, so I show up to the scene expecting bags that are kind of covered in eggs and maggots and we go into the home and there's two bags that have the remains in there and there's no insects on the bags at all. And I was a little surprised. Two and a half weeks is this timeline that the perpetrator gave us uh, since this occurred. And so we had to open the bags or just made a small incision just to verify that they were human remains. And mm -hmm. when we did so, just in a real cursory inspection, I didn't see any insects and the decomposition didn't match up for that time point for two and a half weeks. It was still, still looked relatively fresh in terms of color and, and consistency. So we transport the remains uh, to the morgue and we're able to do the autopsy. And as soon as the remains come out, again, decomposition doesn't quite add up. Um, and there's no obvious insects outside. Uh, outside of the body. So I'm very confused at this point. We start to do the examination. I'm able to collect three maggots from the mouth. And they're pretty large. They're third and star maggots. But then it wasn't until the, the internal examination when we did a dissection of the neck that I was able to collect the rest of the insect evidence. So there were only 75 maggots in total that I collected from these remains, which was really unusual. Um, given that timeline that the perpetrator had provided and all of the details. And so in this case, um, working with the pathologist who was able to evaluate decomposition, I was able to analyze those insects and provide a timeline that those insects have been active on the body for five days, not the two and a half weeks that the perpetrator had provided. And so in providing that information to law enforcement and in further questioning, they determined that the timeline provided by the perpetrator wasn't accurate. And it was likely because of uh, substances that had been consumed that may have affected his perception of time. And, and so my timeline was actually able to be used to determine a more approximate time of that decedent's death, which contradicted mm -hmm. the perpetrator's timeline. Very interesting. So yeah. interesting. Yeah. Wow. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. Sealing, like sealing of the human remains, like you said, is also a very interesting revenue that clearly you have worked on immensely. But to look for evidence on outside of the bag, I would have never thought. Well, I mean, but having that experience and yeah. like, okay, in the field, this is what we see and kind of having that expectation. I thought that there was going to just be insects all over the place. And, you know, with this one, I, I didn't mention this before, but the dismemberment took place with a chainsaw and the chainsaw was in the room of the house. And I also expected because the chainsaw had tissue and, and decomp fluid, I expected that at least insect activity would be present on that instrument and it wasn't. So there was just a lot of things that didn't quite add up with that initial story that was provided. So how did the mouth have the magnet activity? Was it sealed as well? No, the mouth the mouth wasn't sealed. Uh, the The remains were cut in half, and then each half was put into a bag. But the mouth mouth was open, and even if even if the mouth um, is only partially open, the flies can still right. can still crawl in and, right. and deposit their eggs. Interesting. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't I didn't want that to be too graphic. I no, that's fine. That's, okay. <laughs> it's very important to get the details of the case. <laughs> Yeah. The audience know what they're getting into. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'll let Julian ask one of the last questions that we have. Oh. Um, so I guess I wanted to know like uh what we wanted to know, like what are some of the uh qualities or traits to becoming a forensic entomologist? 
Yeah. So uh, obviously you have to be interested in insects. And one of the interesting things that I find when I, I train law enforcement in all different states and I can talk about decomposition and many of them have been to death scenes. So they know what that is like. And right. as soon as I start talking about the maggots, that seems to be the boundary that people don't want to cross. <laughs> so I talk about body was bloated and, and all these different horrible things that happen. But as soon as you introduce maggots, that's like, people are like, Oh no, 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 don't, don't talk about that. And that, that tends yeah. to be where people get grossed out. So obviously if you're wanting to go into this field, you really do have to be interested in the insects because that's going to be your primary focus. And you're going to be the one that's expected to have to go collect those maggots and go into some of these horrible places and, and be looking and be observing those insects. So having a real passion for insects is, is pretty crucial. I would also say a strong stomach. So I've certainly had students in the past that, that think that they are interested in forensic science or they're interested in death investigation. And then they come into the lab and our lab, we, we keep it very tidy, but because we feed our maggots that beef liver and there's a smell associated with decomposing liver, they'll come in and they'll say, oh, what is that? And it's like, it's a jar of maggots eating liver. And they're like, oh, I can't handle this. Well, if you can't handle that smell, you're not going to be able to handle all of the smells that you're going to see at a scene or at an autopsy, right? right? So having that strong stomach, I think is really helpful. But I think probably one of the more difficult parts of, of forensic science in any capacity is the secondary trauma that you can face with either being at those scenes or hearing about the scenes and having to, to go through those documents. So a lot of the cases that I, I end up getting asked to contribute to, I wasn't at that scene, but I'm reviewing all of these photos and I'm looking at all of this horrific material uh, that was somebody's absolute worst you know, worst thing that ever happened. And so right. having to have the emotional impact of that, I think is something that's really stressful and something that you have to really be mindful of and you have to work on because it's something that is going to be a part of the job. It's something that you have to be aware of and it's not an area that you can just say, oh, I'll deal with it later because it will come out in one way or another and it's going mm -hmm. to affect you whether it does right now or it does years from now it's going to have an impact and so so one of the the areas that i always stress to my students is the emotional side of working in forensic science and just being cognizant of how it can impact you and making sure that you're aware and that you're communicating that you have the right support network to be able to succeed in this field yeah Thank you. That's a beautiful piece of advice. Thank you. Oh, sure. That's sure. And also your website. Oh my God, it's so beautiful. Did Which you one did you it? did you look at my Purdue one or my yes. one? no oh, the one okay. that you have like by your name where you open it and there's a fly and then oh yeah so oh thank you I'm glad okay, you it even so beautiful well, thanks yeah we have we have some good photos of of flies and they're like I, I said to Julian before I think they're really beautiful. Um, they're very photogenic. They're really colorful. So <laughs> yeah. I have some, my mom made me earrings that have, these are blowflies. Oh, they're yeah. actually from my lab. Oh, so and then, and then she made me, they're maggots and pupae. These are made out of clay. Uh, but, oh, amazing. oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, my God. So beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I was so late. Um, Not a problem. To get some work done. But this is so wonderful and so informative. Thank you so much for your time. Sure. And yeah, cool yeah. Website. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank yeah, you. Thank sure. you so, so much. Yeah.